Despite the overwhelming amount of hype surrounding it upon its release, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 has always been one of the most underrated games in the entire Five Nights at Freddy's franchise. This has always confused me a lot, because I feel that it's the best game the series has to offer. Everything ranging from its scary atmosphere, to its sad narrative, to its main villain have made Five Nights at Freddy's 3 into one of my favorite horror games ever made. Not many seem to share this opinion with me, however, with the general consensus being that it's the worst in the franchise, which I think is really unfair. The game has many qualities that it brought to the table which are easily overlooked by fans, which I plan to go in depth on, and the first of which being one of the absolute most important. When creating the third game in the franchise, it was apparent that Scott Coffin had to try something new with this one. The original pizzeria setting had already been done twice, and the third game had to be unique in order to keep the series interesting. What Scott ended up opting for was one of the most unique ideas the series has ever seen. Fazbear's Fright is such an amazing setting for a horror game because it really allowed Scott to do what he wanted and make it as decrepit and eerie as possible, which certainly paid off in the end. Fazbear's Fright is a nasty location. The office you find yourself in is constantly drenched in an eerie green light source, with disconnected wires and dirt clinging to your walls, and a window that shows you everything that's coming your way right in front of you. The original animatronics that once hunted you down are now hollowed out husks, used simply as decorations to add on to the atmosphere, and make you feel like whatever you're dealing with in this game is far worse than they ever were. All these aspects work together to create a dreadful experience, where even on night one, where there is no immediate threat, the atmosphere alone makes you worry about what's going to happen. This kind of atmosphere couldn't be created in the previous two installments because the setting limited how morbid Scott could make them. In the pizzeria setting, the more decrepit you make the building, the more it begins to break your immersion. But in Fazbear's Fright, the scary it is, the better it becomes. Five Nights at Freddy's 1 was a great example of when this kind of atmosphere was done right, but I feel that Five Nights at Freddy's 3 steps it up a notch with just how much more dark the atmosphere feels. This setting also works perfectly in conjunction with the game's mechanics. Everything that occurs over the course of the gameplay, be it a detriment or a tool you use to defend yourself, is a product of the setting. The audio system which you rely on through the whole game to stay alive in the first place is only there canonically so that your character can scare people making their way through the attraction. The maintenance panel which causes some of the most dreadful scenarios in the entire game is a product of all the tools at your disposal being salvaged. It was never meant to be used by a real night guard, but rather be part of the show. You're essentially in a real survival situation where you're forced to use props to protect yourself. This is complemented by the fact that the game never outright tells you what to do. It instead opts to imply it through the phone guy's training tapes you're left with and allow you the player to figure it out on your own. This makes the game far more immersive because it makes you feel like you really are an ill-equipped night guard who's improvising with what you have to stay alive, and it makes you, the player, feel more rewarded when you figure out what it is you're doing. Even the phantom animatronics play perfectly into the setting. These ghosts appear in every corner of the game, popping out at you left, right, and center, but never actually killing you. This to me is very reminiscent of how real horror attractions work, with many actors and props popping out of the darkness to startle you. It really makes the phantom animatronics feel like they belong in the game as part of the overall experience, causing you to panic with every single jump scare because you know that a real threat is slowly working its way towards you while you're distracted. Speaking of which, that brings me to easily the most important thing introduced by Five Nights at Freddy's 3. If you were to ask me who my favorite video game character is, my answer would be Springtrap. 
Springtrap is easily one of, if not the most interesting and important character in the entire Five Nights at Freddy's franchise, and Scott made sure we knew this when the game was first revealed to us. In every single teaser for the game, there was one detail he always made sure we knew, and that there was only one character left by the point this game took place. This had everyone, including myself, speculating about the identity of this mysterious character, and our curiosity peaked when the trailer was released, and we got our first good look at him. Springtrap is easily the most horrific and grotesque looking character in the entire series, and he really set the stage for what to expect from this third installment. His rotted exterior combined with the little bits of human flesh poking out from underneath his suit make him really unsettling to look at. This was the first game in the series where the design of the villain alone made me genuinely really afraid to play it when the game was released and this dread followed through when I finally sat down and did it. Facing against Springtrap in FNAF 3 really feels like what I would describe as being the final boss fight of the franchise. While the other installments of the series had you facing several simple threats at once in its animatronic roster, FNAF 3 instead has you facing one extremely complex threat. Springtrap has a massive set of tools at his disposal, which he uses to make his way into your office and kill you, whether it be slowly lumbering his way towards you, being only stalled by the audio you play over the speakers, or climbing into the vents to get to you even faster if you're not quick enough to stop him. He always makes sure to hide from your camera's view, as if he's always acutely aware of your eyes watching him. This can cause split seconds of panic when he disappears from your sight, because you have to live with the constant dread of knowing that once he does arrive at your office, there is no way to defend yourself from him. Every time he moves closer, you can hear the muffled sounds of his footsteps and his groans of pain, adding even further to the dark atmosphere and creating a constant need to know where he is. This panic reaches its climax when you hear the dreaded sound of him entering the vents, causing you to flip through the camera, trying desperately to seal off the right one before it's too late. And when it is too late, nothing will ever quite match the absolute feeling of hopelessness when you hear the loud banging of him exiting the vents, causing the ambience to kick into high gear. Other games in the series would later try to replicate the final boss feeling of Springtrap, Nightmare Fredbear in FNAF 4, or Ennard in Sister Location for example, but none of them could ever quite deliver in the same way he did, because he did it first, and he was given far more build up in the lore and over the course of the game. And that brings me to another incredibly important aspect of Springtrap, which was the air of mystery surrounding his identity. When Five Nights at Freddy's 3 first came out, nobody knew who he was, and much of the enjoyment of playing through the game for the first time was trying to figure out just that. Was he a Frankenstein abomination of the original four characters? What about the suit that the phone guy was stuffed into? Was he Golden Bonnie? We had so many questions and we desperately wanted to figure them all out. Little details sprinkled through the game, like the phone calls and the mini-games, allowed us to slowly piece together bits of his identity, and it was only after the Night 5 cutscene that we'd finally learn who he really was. And it changed everything. Even if you're not a fan of the FNAF series, the lore of the games is something people have always been drawn to learning about. Entire careers were built off of people simply discussing the inner workings of this complex series, so a great entry in the franchise would need to have great lore behind it. The lore of Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was easily the darkest the series had ever gotten at the point of the game's release, and it had Springtrap to largely thank for that. 
The story of this game centers around us trying to figure out what exactly happened after the closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and who Springtrap really is. We learn that the game takes place 30 years after the closing of the original pizzeria, and the events that transpired there became a sort of viral phenomenon. People began to fear Freddy Fazbear's and the hauntings that occurred there, and that was when someone had the bright idea to try and make bank off of it with the creation of Fazbear's Fright. The premise of the game's plot is incredibly unique and creative for the series, and it starts to really get going once the salvage crews venture into Freddy Fazbear's and discover Springtrap alongside several vintage training tapes. As I said before, trying to piece together Springtrap's identity was the main source of intrigue while playing through Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Every night we're greeted to a brand new phone call from the original phone guy, which gives us little tiny snippets of information about what kind of animatronic he is, with every single one describing something increasingly dangerous. These phone calls also went alongside small 8-bit minigames at the end of every single night which show us some much needed background of what happened before the game's events occurred. And it's in these minigames we learn the shocking twist that Springtrap was actually the purple guy the whole time, killed in the suit he used to lure children away to murder them. This changed everything about Five Nights at Freddy's 3, and even further set in stone the final boss fight feeling I described this game having. In the previous two games, we were facing victims of the story's events. Innocent children who were murdered and were letting out their rage on us. But in this game, we're facing the cause of all those terrible events. We face the character who was responsible for the previous two games even happening in the first place, the purple guy. And that reveal alone makes this game feel like a true conclusion to the franchise, with us doing one final fight against the monster that allowed it to happen in the first place, the murderer who was now trapped inside of his own murder device. What makes this game feel even more like the proper conclusion the franchise needed is that the original cast of animatronics were now resting in peace by the game's end, the death of the purple guy being the one final thing they needed to be free. In the good ending, they all share one final birthday party together, something that was taken from them when they were brutally murdered, and it allowed them to finally let go of their anger and be free from the torment the purple guy caused them. With the poetic irony of it all being that now he must suffer the same way they did by becoming Springtrap. This ending to the franchise honestly made me shed tears when I first saw it, and I felt that it was the best ending the series could have had. It had everything an ending needed, it gave us closure to the series that we desperately needed to see, and it still kept so many mysteries intact that we as fans could continue to discuss years later. But unfortunately, that's not the way the series went, and a beautiful conclusion was drawn out for the sake of continuing the franchise. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 has been my favorite game in the franchise since it first released, and I feel like it will continue to be this way forever. The game has absolutely everything you could want in an installment of the series, whether it be its sinister atmosphere that just screams the word evil, its horrifying villain who still haunts the series to this day, or its amazing story that the series could have ended on. I always look at the games that came after and wonder to myself if they really need to exist. Don't get me wrong, I think they're fine games that all have their own strengths to them, but I can't help but feel like we would have been better off if 3 was the true conclusion to the franchise. 
Regardless, I still love these games a lot, and I have my hopes that someday Scott will be able to create a game that I can love just as much, if not more, than Five Nights at Freddy's 3.